The sun. Nothing seems more vital to life on Earth, and yet nothing seems more taken for granted of. Nearly every day, we expect the sun to rise over the horizon to give us light and warmth. The presence of the sun, and even the lack thereof, can have a tremendous effect on our feelings and emotions. As we continue our series of life's highs and lows, we are going to explore the imagery presented to us in Psalm 19 and how we can take those feelings and emotions from the sun and relate them to our own relationship with God. Check it out. For those of us in Florida, today's psalm might just qualify as our state's official psalm. I mean, did you catch that in the first few verses of the psalm? The primary landscape of this psalm is the sun, which is great, right? We all love the sun, at least in moderation. Tans, great. Sunburns, not so great. Or take this weird fact. From 1967 to 1969, St. Petersburg, Florida set a yet to be beaten record of 768 days with at least some sunshine. Meaning that for over two years, not a day went by when you could not get a glimpse of the sun. But then this past winter was actually the gloomiest on record. We had the least amount of sunlight in the state of Florida on record. And I'm sure that for some of us, our moods track with the presence or absence of the sun. We even have a phrase for that, seasonal affective disorder. The acronym is SAD. I'm not kidding. And as we are in the midst of spring, this is an appropriate landscape for us today. Because as we'll see in Psalm 19, and as we see in our own lives, the sun is associated with balance. Too much of it and drought occurs, lawns dry up and our skin literally burns. And too little sun and our moods are affected our body's chemistry changes, and plants stop growing. So let's jump into Psalm 19 by looking at how it is constructed, and we'll see that the sun explicitly and implicitly lays the foundation for this whole text. Psalm 19 has three distinct parts. You probably caught that when we were reading it, and if you didn't, go ahead and grab a Bible and just open it up to Psalm 19, and you'll see it. There's going to be white space delineating three distinct parts in the psalm. There's a creation psalm in verses 1 through 6, a psalm focused on Torah in verses 7 through 10, and a servant psalm in verses 11 through 14. Three distinct parts that we'll be exploring together. Three distinct parts that provide a sense of balance in the spiritual life. Three distinct parts that C.S. Lewis referred to as, quote, the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Now, it's no wonder that C.S. Lewis loved this psalm so much. It has something for the naturalist, the scholar, and the pious. And if, we allow the, and if we allow the psalm to be broken apart, that is what we end up with. The scientist, well, the scientist loves verse 1. In fact, Warner von Braun, the inventor of the Saturn V rocket that took astronauts to the moon, well, he has Psalm 19.1 on his tombstone. The heavens declare the glory of God. Yeah, that's appropriate for a guy who invented the rockets that took people to the moon. The scholar meditates on verse 7 as they study scripture, looking for meaning. And the pious preacher, they pray verse 14 before a sermon as a sincere desire that their 15 minutes of content each Sunday would be pleasing to God. But I think C.S. Lewis himself, being an imaginative writer, scholar, and a pious person, is reminding us that this psalm, is beautiful in its totality. And after spending a week with this psalm, I tend to agree with C.S. Lewis. This is one of the greatest poems in all of the psalms. Because for both the ancient and the modern reader, it's an indicator of the balance within our souls and a helpful corrective for our desire for easy answers from scripture. Case in point, I had prepared illustrations for this very sermon based on stars, constellations, galaxies, human spaceflight. I mean, this weekend is the 34th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope being launched. There could have been pictures and videos and all kinds of stuff I could have shown you, all because of my fixation on the first third of the Psalms, of this Psalm. But those images didn't provide any illumination, no pun intended, for the final two thirds of this text. 
You see, the first third of the psalm is setting up the law, not as something mysterious or vast like the universe, but rather something as constant and as necessary as the sun. This psalm isn't about mystery. It's about order and balance. See, it's comparing the balance provided by the sun with the balance provided by scripture. Check this out. Think of everything we get from the sun. Seasons, weather, wind, warmth, light. It's not flashy or showy. It's just there. And thank God it is. I mean, without it, there would be no life, no earth. And it is absolutely vital. And it provides order and rhythm to our life. It is so vital that the sun is one of the first gods that ancient cultures would worship. The Egyptians worshipped Ra. And the Akkadians, a civilization that settled in and around Israel, they worshipped a god named Shamash. In fact, many scholars think that this first third of the psalm was an ancient hymn to Shamash that the psalmist repurposed to be about the Israelite god. Many cultures around the world, even those without huge pantheons, had a god or multiple gods who represented the sun. And within that hierarchy, there were competing gods whose very existence created the balance in the created order. But for the ancient poet of Psalm 19, balance was achieved in a different way. Surrounded by cultures that understood the world as a competition between gods vying for power and control over humanity, the psalmist understood that even something as vital as the sun is ultimately not a being itself, but a product of God's handiwork. I mean, that language that the sun is like a horse ready to run its course. Something's holding the sun back because God, in the psalmist's mind, holds the sun back and sets its course. The sun doesn't act in and of itself. God is in control. God provides the celestial balance. And for us today, the first third of this psalm is a humbling reminder that the mysteries of space the month-to-month -month order of the seasons, the week-to-week -week weather patterns, and the day-to-day -day passage of time are all a wondrous gift. There's balance in the created world. Even when life feels chaotic and uncontrollable, uncont there's balance. And balance doesn't have to mean boring. I mean, ask anybody who was in the path of totality of the solar eclipse earlier this month. The sun came out of its tent and the moon was like, I'm here too. Order can be amazing and awe-inspiring. We watched here in Florida as the sky got a little bit darker at 2 p.m., the air got cooler than it should be at 2 p.m., and the shadows got really surreal as they became half circles or little slices of light. Without eclipse glasses, I had to fashion a pinhole camera to see the partial eclipse. And it was really amazing to see a small projection of a perfect circle being eclipsed by an even slightly smaller perfect circle. Two celestial bodies moving orderly beside each other. Balance can be amazing and inspiring, which provides a natural transition to the middle of the psalm. If the sun is orderly and nothing can escape its heat, then what else is orderly and escapable? Well, for the psalmist, it's the Torah, God's instructions. Those first five books of the Bible that contain the origin story of the Hebrew people. After reflecting on the order and arrangement of the sky, the psalmist turns their gaze to the most important texts of their life. They probably had those texts memorized, by the way, which is ridiculous to think. Five books of the Bible memorized that they could pull from to encourage them and to direct their lives. Here it's important to note what the Torah is. The Torah is what we know today as the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It tells the history of the Hebrew people from creation they're fleeing to Egypt, they're escaping Egypt, they're wandering in the wilderness, and eventually they're arriving at the edge of the promised land. It's a very long journey, all to end up close to where it all started. <laughs> Along the way, God gave these wandering people instructions, laws, commandments, and decrees to set them up for success as they prepared to enter the promised land. And notice the psalmist's language regarding the Torah. It's joyful, excited, it's thankful. The Torah is not a source of chastisement. It's a celebration of right relationship with God. The Torah even enlightens, which is a deliberate playfulness on the part of the poet to tie the sun imagery from the first third of the psalm into the second part of the psalm. And here again, the poet is reminded of a balance with Torah. If the ancient readers of this poem were to ever feel that God's instructions had become onerous, burdensome, or undesirable, the poet reminds the reader 
that the Torah is more desirable than gold. And in an enduring image for later Jewish rabbis, Torah is sweeter than honey and the drippings of honeycomb. This particular image was so striking that medieval rabbis would begin a year of Torah teaching with young students by writing the Hebrew alphabet or a passage of Torah in honey and then invite the children to lick up the letters that had just been written. It was a literal connection of the words of Torah with sweetness. And here we, the modern Christian reader, are confronted with a very real truth about the Old Testament and the law. A truth that dispels the myth that Jesus replaced the Old Testament or that the law was graceless. Nothing about this depiction of the law suggests that it would be used to chastise or harass or demean. In its purest form, the law is something to cherish and celebrate. The law is God's way of setting up relationship with us, healthy relationship with healthy boundaries. Would it be that all of our relationships and our expectations of others were enlightening, whole, pure, and as sweet as honey? And finally, the sunlight reaches into the inmost parts of the psalmist, and we're giving a win given a window into their own inner thoughts, their anxieties, and their worries. This is one of the most powerful things that the Psalms can do, and it sets it apart from almost any other writing in Scripture. We get an actual peek into the joys and fears of real people over 2,000 years ago. The psalmist's concerns are twofold, inner thoughts and outer influences, both of which need to be revealed to them. Thankfully, the psalmist has two resources available to them, God, and paradoxically, paradoxically, this psalm itself. This final self-referential verse is a petition over the 13 verses that came prior. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Included at the very end, these two lines are the ignition for the entire prayer. God, may this prayer I just spoke and my heart as I spoke it be pleasing to you. The phrase meditations of my heart might be translated murmurings or whispers. There's some way in which the heart is actually speaking, making sounds, or in some way making a text of its own. Robert Alter chose the word stirrings, but he notes in his translation that he much would have preferred the word murmurings were it not associated with a heart condition. There's something going on in the heart here where the heart is making its own language. In the ancient mindset, the language is that our mouths speak and our hearts do too. The psalmist is asking that both of these would be acceptable to God. Now, earlier I joked about the very, this very line, about how preachers can use it as a get-out-of-jail-free card for their weekly spoken content. And sometimes it can seem to be deployed in that manner. But in its sincerest sense for us today, these two simple lines are an invitation to balance balance between our spoken word and our silent words, that they might be aligned. And in a broader sense, this entire psalm is about balance. Natural theology without scripture or reflection does not reveal the full picture of God or the full person, person of Jesus. You can't have the first third of this psalm without the rest of it. At its worst, natural theology has contributed to caste systems or oppression where one people group sees themselves as the most orderly, the most perfect, the most chosen, and they seek to rid the world of the disorder presented by others. German Christians defended their support of the Nazi regime under the guise of natural theology. Likewise, scripture without grounding in the real world of science, relationship, personal meditation, and humility is often cruel, judgmental, and divisive. The law goes from being whole, sure, right, and clear to an indictment of lifestyles, practices, and beliefs with little room for grace and understanding or any semblance that there might be multiple perspectives to hold in tension. The center of this psalm cannot hold without the beginning and the end. And personal piety without connection to the world and to scripture is isolation and withdrawal. Our souls need all three. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what words to speak in our, with our mouths or with our hearts that would be pleasing. So two years ago, I realized I needed to start seeing a counselor. I didn't have words for what was wrong, but I was withdrawing and pulling inward. I was overwhelmed and disconnected from myself and my purpose in life. I wasn't sleeping well, 
eating well or really taking care of myself physically. I guess you could say I was out of balance. Over the past two years though, through twice monthly counseling sessions, I've learned how to be more aware of my inner life. The ways my self-talk, the words in my mouth, and the meditations in my heart can be anxious or unhelpful. And I'm learning how to reframe the, that language to speak better things with my mouth and in my heart. But I still struggle with feeling overwhelmed and maintaining balance. You know what my counselor told me in our last session? I was particularly stressed out about something at work. She said, you should step away from your desk more often. Go for a walk, get outside, get some sun. Wouldn't you know, it brings balance into my life. Fleeting at times, but it's a good start. Maybe that's what you need. Or maybe you need a reframed sense of your relationship with scripture and God's law as something that is sweet and life-giving. Or maybe you just need to be in awe of God's majesty in the sky and in the universe. Whatever your soul needs, may you find it in the landscape of Psalm 19 this week. Let's pray together. Oh God, thank you for preserving these ancient prayers throughout history so that in them we might get a glimpse of another person making meaning of their own life and in that see ourselves. You have created us with a sense of wonder and awe, a desire to search for meaning. So may the words of our mouths and the murmurings of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. I really hoped you enjoyed uh, today's sermon and that you got something from it. Now, if you want to explore the deeper meaning behind this message, there'll be notes down in the description box below with reflection questions and even a link to our Next Steps page where you can learn more about Hyde Park, get connected with a small group, or even learn how to become a member with us. I'm Sam. I'll see you next week.